church. So I volunteered to have it. That way I knew I had a chance to speak. We've had some great speakers in these last few days. It's unbelievable. It's exciting. It's powerful. What God is doing in, in the city around this country is amazing. It's exciting. And I know that one thing that's happening as we are here tonight, and those of us who've been here for the last three days, is that our, our, our heads are just so swollen with all kinds of ideas, and all kinds of new dreams, and all kinds of new thoughts, and all kinds of things that we want to go back to our own homes and we want to do. And we've got some big dreams now, because we've seen so many things that have happened, not only here in Lawndale, and over at Bethel, and Circle, and all the places, we share with one another, we've heard the speakers from all over, and all
Then I met a beautiful woman after living here for one year.
he was, uh, July 30th, he was going to stay for the 4th of July. We went in. I had no fans. I had no screens. My apartment, she couldn't get it cooled down. And my father-in-law got sick. And in the morning of the 4th of July, that we're going to spend this great holiday together. There's an announcement to me when he saw me as soon as he woke up. Because he said, I'm leaving. I'm going back to Indiana today. We'll see you later. <laughs> my wife, Ann, that night, and if you didn't believe what I first said, you'll believe it now. My father-in-law and my mother-in-law went to bed. My wife and I got back and we sat down and we were sleeping on the floor that night. I only had one bed. And I got on my knees and I was looking in the eyes and I told her I loved her. And I said, honey, you can imagine all the thoughts through my mind, but I said, honey, I think I made a mistake. I think I shouldn't have brought you here. Everybody told me not to. I was too bullheaded. I wasn't supposed to do it. Maybe God's giving us a sign to leave. And my wife Ann looked me in the eye and she says, Honey, I love you and I want to live here. Right. She said, if I hadn't married Ann, I don't think I'd be here today. Now, there's been a few occasions since that time that Ann's wanted to leave, but I told her I gave her a chance. <laughs> that we 
we have found that raising a family in this community is the greatest place in the world to raise a family. Amen. Our children are learning so many things. John and Vera Mae, when they come and spend, last night, John and Vera Mae, I'm going to talk about you now. <laughs> they were in bed, and they were staying in our home, and they were back in bed, and we had a family meeting on the bed. They're on their night clothes. Pajamas John had on, I gave him about, what, six months ago. He had forgotten some. But we're laying on the bed. Angela's up on top of Grandpa Perkins. Angela's up on top of Grandpa Perkins. And we're just there. And for a half an hour, all we're doing is talking and having a good time and thinking about what God is doing. And we're talking about Dolphus' talk. And I couldn't believe how much Angela and Andrew, a nine-year-old and a six-year-old, remembered about Dolphus' talk. They remembered almost every word that Dolphus said last night. It was a powerful message. We were talking about the poor. We were talking about what we ought to be doing as our own little part. Let me tell you, raising your family in the inner city is the greatest place to raise your family because your children grow up understanding the world that they live in and not a sheltered life that all they want is what they can buy at the Kmart or the Marshall Fields. This is
knocked two or three cars through it, and there would still be extra room around the roof. This roof was in such bad shape, and I brought a roofing man over here. We had $25,000 in the bank to do the whole job, to remodel the whole building and build a medical clinic. And you know what he said? He said, I'll get back to you, and I'll give you the best bid I possibly can. $89,000. My heart dropped. How are we going to do it for that? But then I had an idea. I don't know if it was a dream or not, but I had an idea. And the idea was, let's try to do it ourselves. And so on spring break of 1984, myself and about 25 high school students, many of who are even in here in this room right now, got up on that roof and started taking it off. And then God laid on the heart a man to donate the month of June to us, who was a carpenter, a professor at Wheaton College. Had no idea he was going to be here tonight, but I see him here. Bubba, stand up, Bubba. Bubba. Bubba came and gave us every day in the, in the month of June, and we rebuilt this roof. And when the roofers came and put it down, we saved fifty thousand dollars by doing it ourselves. Praise God. Now.
You either stay in the neighborhood and pastor the church. If you move, you resign as the pastor and you go pastor someplace else. I told it to him like it was. And you know what he said? I needed to hear that. Don't be watering down what we're trying to do. There's other movements going on. There's other things happening. But this is a movement that's incarnational. We live in this community. This ain't their community. You ain't never going to hear me say there. This is my community. This is my house. This is my church. Because we live here. We don't need to water things down. Now, are we going to go for it or not? I hope we're going to go for it. Now, here's my two keys. I still haven't got to my keys. But I'm on my last page of notes, John. Two keys. The first one, we don't have to be very smart to understand. It's found in Matthew chapter 22. A knucklehead lawyer says to Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus said, that's simple. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, and all your mind. Now we know the second one, and CCD people are great in love with their neighbors. If you're not, then you're in the wrong business. But sometimes we get so busy loving our neighbors and creating programs that we forget number one. The first key to what we're trying to do is to love God with all of our heart, soul, and mind. We need to be people who love God. That's got to be our number one priority, is putting God first in our lives. Whatever that takes, whatever that means, that's what we have to do. That's the key to making dreams happen. Not to dreaming new dreams, but to putting God first in our lives. You know what? When we put God first in our lives, God makes things happen. I know many times I've looked around and I thought, what in the world is going on here? I don't understand. I can't. What is happening? This is too big for me. It's too marvelous. Out there in the gym, you hope you've seen our banner. There ain't no names on that. It's in burnt orange and navy blue for the bears. That's the bears' colors, but they're naming on it. But it's the Lawndale Miracle. And at the bottom of it, there's a Bible verse, Ephesians 3.20. God was able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all we ever ask or dream. That's what God can do. When we put God first in our lives and say, God, use me in any way that you want, then God makes our dreams happen. That's what we have to do. But don't try to make the dreams happen on your own. Now, it takes hard work. But you've got to put God first. The second thing, the second key to making these dreams a reality, it's easy to dream dreams. It's hard to bring them about. But the second thing is being committed to the worshiping community. You know, God didn't ordain Circle Urban Ministries, but he did rock church. God didn't ordain Bethel New Life, but he did Bethel Lutheran Church. God didn't ordain Lawndale Christian Health Center or Lawndale Christian Development Corporation, but he did Lawndale Community Church. Let me help you understand that God's ordained institution in the world is the church. The church is God's idea, not my idea. The church is God's dream, not somebody else's dream. And so we have to make sure that the church is at the center of what we're doing. Let me tell you, here in Lawndale, as the church deacons oversee everything that goes on here, they know the church brings us back to reality. We come together, we worship together, and then we struggle together, and we dream together. We have to be sure that we are centered on the church in the community, not the church at large, but the church in the community that we're striving to reach for Jesus Christ. That is the key. If we lose the church, we lose the movement. And the movement, I think, is what God would have for us to do. Hear me on that, please. Don't have a whole bunch of new little independent organizations out there. That ain't what God needs. God wants the church to do its thing. Bethel Lutheran Church, self-supporting, now reaching the west side for Jesus Christ. That's what God wants to have happen. We don't need no more young life, youth for Christ, and all these other things. We need the church to be the church. We need the church to be the church. And the church is about loving people. That's what we need to do. This church and the churches that we talk about need to be here. My heart is a little heavy tonight. Some have left. Gone home, that's great. They're probably
probably the ones that don't need to hear what I say because they're going home. They want to be at their church tomorrow. But I'll tell you, my heart is a little heavy that we're going to go home and dream all these big dreams. And five years from now, many of us are going to fall on our faces and we're going to get discouraged and we're going to cry and we're going to say those people don't want me there and we're going to leave. And if that happens, what we've done with this association is a failure. I don't think God needs any more John Perkins. But what God wants, not Moses's, but Joshua's, to stick in there, to take the land for God, and to stick with it until the day we die.